night, as our brother has said, a warm welcome in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, turn with me to First Chronicles, please. I'm going to ask you to take a reading with me in First Chronicles and in chapter 9. Now, initially, I had something else on my mind for ministry for this Tuesday night. And the more I looked at it, the more it just didn't seem to be right. And so I was impressed again with what I'm going to read tonight. And I do trust it will impress the Lord's people as much as it seems to have refreshed itself in my mind. First Chronicles chapter 9 will be our first reading. And we read from verse number 1, First Chronicles 9, verse 1. So all Israel were reckoned by genealogies. And behold, they were written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah, who were carried away to Babylon for their transgressions. Now the first inhabitants that dwelt in their possessions in their cities were the Israelites. And it gives us this list. Really what it's doing, beloved saints, is it's showing us that the captivity in Babylon has taken place. God has brought them back. And these are those who settled in the land after the captivity. That's the subject of First Chronicles 9. Look with me at verse number 17. And the porters, the gatekeepers, were Shalom, and Akub, and Talman, and Aheman, and their brethren. Shalom was the chief, who hitherto waited in the king's gate eastward. They were porters in the companies of the children of Levi. Verse 20, and Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, was the ruler over them in time past, and the Lord was with him. And Zechariah, the son of Meshelamiah, was porter of the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. All these were chosen to be porters in the gates, were 212. These were reckoned by their genealogies in their villages, whom David and Samuel the seer did ordain in their set offices. So they and their children had the oversight of the gates of the house of the Lord, namely the house of the tabernacle by wards. In four quarters were the porters towards the east and the west and the north and south. And their brethren were in their villages, and they were to come after seven days from time to time with them. For these Levites, the four chief porters, were in their set office and were over the chambers and treasuries of the house of God. And they lodged round about the house of God because the charge was upon them and the opening thereof every morning pertained to them. And certain of them had the charge of the ministering vessels that they should bring them in and out by number. Some of them also were appointed to oversee the vessels and all the instruments of the sanctuary and the fine flour, and the wine, and the oil, and the frankincense, and the spices. Now come over to the book of Psalms, just for a, a reference. I'm not really going to speak about this. I just want to reference it. Psalm number 84. And when I give this reference, all the beloved saints, will uh, you'll know this reference. And at that point, you'll know where I'm going in the ministry. Psalm number 84. And we read verse number 10. And it says, for a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. And God bless to us these two references from the sacred scriptures. Now, what I want to speak to you about are porters. If you want to call them doorkeepers or porters, whatever expression you use that's best for you, that's what we're going to consider this evening in the ministry of the scriptures. And of course, from the book of Psalms, we have picked up the thread. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. I was actually asked to speak on this Last winter, I received a communication from the United Kingdom, and the dear brother that emailed me, he told me about the assembly, and he said over the winter they were going to be taking up 
various gates from the scriptures. For example, Genesis chapter 28. You remember dear Jacob. He woke out of sleep and Jacob says, this is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And someone was going to take up the gate of heaven. And then the gates of the righteous through which the righteous shall enter. Someone was going to speak on the gates of the righteous. Another brother, he was going to speak from the book of Nehemiah on the gates of the city of Jerusalem. You remember Nehemiah chapter three and the 10 gates. And so they requested of me that I would speak on the gates of the temple. And without checking the biblical data, I simply responded. And I said, sure, I'd be honored. I counted a privilege to speak on the gates of the temple. What I didn't know was this. I started to look after sending the email for some of the references to the gates of the temple. And I found there was very precious material, very little material. In fact, almost no material. And I wondered to myself, what am I going to do with this? I've already committed to it. I've said I'll speak on these gates. And now here I am, and I have nothing to speak on. Well, I'm going to take it up with you, dear saints, tonight. The gates of the temple in Jerusalem. Now, there are various sanctuaries in Scripture, and we do know a little bit about the gates. For example, there will be a temple built in the future. You'll find it in the book of Ezekiel. From Ezekiel chapter 40 to Ezekiel chapter 48, that temple, the millennial temple, is delineated in the Scriptures, and the gates, very particularly, the gates come to the fore. And in, in, in Ezekiel 40 particularly, you'll find lots of references to the gates. And so in the future, there's a sanctuary and the disclosure of the gates. If you read in Revelation chapter 21, there's a sanctuary city. John sees it coming down from heaven, from the abode of God. And John actually speaks about the gates. And he says on the north, three gates. And on the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. And on the east, three gates. And he speaks. And it's not the disclosure of the gates. He actually gives a description of the gates. And so I started to look in First Chronicles and in some of these historical books for the disclosure of the gates of the temple. And I couldn't find it. And I started to look for the description of the gates of the temple. And I couldn't get them. But then I found to myself, what I found was this. The most interesting thing, that the Bible doesn't emphasize the disclosure of the gates. Josephus tells us a little bit about it. It doesn't emphasize the disclosure of the gates or the description of the gates. What it does emphasize is the duties that were associated with the gates. And that's what I'm going to speak about for about, well, our brethren have told me just to take, take as much time as you want, but I won't do that. Maybe for about 20, 25 minutes, I want to speak about the duties of these gates. I was actually staying. There's a lovely text in First Chronicles chapter 26 about these gates. First Chronicles chapter 26 and verse number 18, it says this, at Parbar westward, four at the causeway, and two at Parbar. Now, I was staying with dear Maxine and uh, Lionel over in Clemensville, Lionel Cress. And that was actually part of my reading one time. This is a couple of years ago. And I came down for lunch. And I looked at dear Maxine across the lunch table. They were so kind to me, by the way. They treated me as if I was their son. I would come in in the morning after having been out early. I would come in in the morning and Lionel would have the coffee ready to go just at eight o'clock. Then I come down for lunch and dear, dear Maxine had the lunch ready. And there I was sitting at the lunch table and I looked across to Maxine and I said, at Parbar westward, four at the causeway and two at Parbar. And Maxine looked at me and she said, sorry, John, what language is that? I said, that's English. And more than that, that's actually from the King James Version of the Bible. Most likely what it's telling us is this, that on the west side of the temple, there were two gates. And on the west side of the temple, six Levites were standing at the gates. Now listen to the text again. At Parbar westward, 
four Levites at the causeway, and two at Parbar. And so if you're looking at that text or reading it in your own reading, now you know what it's talking about. Parbar westward, four Levites at the causeway, and two at Parbar. Now, what I want to do tonight is this, very simply. You might be looking at First Chronicles chapter 9, and you're thinking, what's he ever going to get from this? I'm going to speak about three things, very simply. Three very simple things. There's going to be work, which is our focus. And I want you to notice the chronicle of the work. And then we will see together the centrality of the work. And the last thing I'm going to touch, if I've got time, is the charge of the work. Because if your Bible is open in 1 Chronicles chapter 9, just look at verse number 27 again. It says, the charge was upon the Levites. And look at verse number 28. Certain of them had charge of the ministering vessels. So we're going to speak about those three things. We'll notice the chronicle of the work. And then the centrality in the work. And the last thing, the charge of the work that God gave to these men. I, I hardly need to tell you, but God has given us a charge. Just as there was a charge placed into the hands of these men. And these men were to work for God. I'm speaking to dear saints tonight. And there's a charge. And it's been given to us. And God expects us to work. And he has given work for us to do. And he has given duties. And he expects us to carry out those duties for his glory in his name for the honor of the Lord Jesus. And so the first thing then, this chronicle of the work of these men that were gatekeepers, they were noted for their work. You see, one of the things that I've mentioned is this, that this chapter from which we have read is when they come back from Babylon. And many of you dear saints already know that when they come back from Babylon, it wasn't the heady days of when they come out of Egypt. When they come out of Egypt, there was two and a half million of them. And it wasn't the days of Solomon when the temple was built, when the land was being populated and the Lord was with them in a mighty way. You see, when they come back from Babylon, it was a day of small things. It was a very difficult day. It was a difficult day to serve God. Now, if you've got the picture that I'm trying to paint for you, this was a difficult day, and it was a day of small things, and it was a day when these people could look around, and these people would say, what's the use? Well, look at how small things are. We remember brighter days. We remember better days. We remember when there were numbers in, 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 around the temple. We remember when things were going for God. We remember when everything was moving, and everything, the vitality of the work. You take a look at it now. Anyone ever think like that? That there were bright days in the past and there were better days in the past. Well, where are those days now? This was a difficult day. And it's a wonderful thing. In a difficult day, God took note of those that served him. Now, I want to encourage the saints tonight because the Lord is still taking note. You see, we are living in an era and we think that God only took note in the past. When Mr. Albert Ramsey was living, God took note. And when Mr. Orosok was, was, was preaching, the Lord was taking note. And when Mr. Hull was around, oh, the Lord noted that. And the Lord saw. And we think that the big days of the past and the bright days are all behind us. I'm not so sure about that, beloved saints. Let's just stop for a moment. I know we're in the midst of a pandemic. And I know this is a difficult day. You know, beloved saints, God still takes note. You say, how do you get that? Well, just look with me for a second. You see, if you look at verse number 20, 1 Chronicles 9 and verse number 20, there's a man, Phineas. He was the son of Eliezer. He was the grandson of Aaron. That goes back to the past. God took note of Aaron, the high priest. God took a note of his son, Eliezer. God took a note of his grandson, Phineas. God took note. And actually, if you look at verse number 23, David is mentioned. King David. God took note of King David. And look again at verse number 23. Samuel is mentioned. God has taken a note. 
that he has actually placed Samuel's name into this record of the chapter. God takes note. But you know, if you look at verse number 17, there are men in this difficult day and they're serving God. Shalom. Akam. Talman. Ahiman. And they were just gatekeepers. Ah, but don't forget what the psalmist said now. I had rather be a doorkeeper. I had rather be a gatekeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. And in a, in a difficult day, God reaches back to the past. And God says, I took a note of what took place in the past. He says, you see the service in the past. I've noted it all. The service of David, it's been record. There's a record of it. And the service of Eliezer, I've got a note of it. And the service of Aaron, I've taken a record of it. You know, beloved saints, God has taken a record of everything that you have done. And there's beloved saints this very day, and they have served their God, just moved about on their daily business in the pathway of faith. And they've served their God, and they've maybe helped a saint, and they've maybe spoken to an unsaved friend, and they've maybe moved about and they're just doing what they normally do in the everyday, <clears throat> excuse me, run-of-mill life experience. And you know, beloved saints, God has taken note. They were noted for their work. The second thing I'll speak about very quickly here, or I won't get beyond this first point. You will notice with me, it's not only that they were noted for their work, and the Lord has taken note. But the very nature of their work, the nature of the work was watchfulness. These men were to stand at the gates. And if you know anything about a gatekeeper, they were watching. We will see in a few minutes that these men had to open the doors. And when they opened the doors of the house of the Lord, there had to be a spirit of watchfulness. They needed to watch what came in. And of course, they had to watch what went out. They were watchful. I'm always reminded as I think of this about the closing parable of Mark's gospel. Mark's gospel, chapter 13, and verse number 33. You will remember that the presentation in Mark's gospel of the Lord Jesus is the servant. It's very fitting that the closing prophetic parable of Mark's gospel is a parable about servants. And the Savior speaks to those disciples, and he says, he says the parable, it's very simply this. It's like a man that has gone into a far country and he has given his servants work and he has commanded the porter to watch. Now he says, watch four times over. The Lord Jesus looks at those men and he says to his disciples, he says, men, watch. You've got to be vigilant and you must be watchful. Watch, watch. I actually heard our brother Bentley minister that. It's a number of years ago now. It was on a Saturday evening in a place called Armagh. I never forget that Saturday night. Our brother Tom Bentley rose to that platform and he spoke about the closing parable of Mark's gospel. And as he was going to it, he paused in the ministry. And there was a tremor come into his voice. And he looked around that audience that night and he said, brethren, overseers particularly, he said, listen, four times over, the Savior says, watch. You know, beloved saints, it hasn't changed. The Lord Jesus, he still commands us to a spirit of watchfulness. In fact, if you read Mark's gospel, you see in the next chapter, the disciples failed in the very thing that Christ told them to do. Four times in Mark 13, watch. You come to Mark 14, and he goes into a garden called Gethsemane. And he takes with him Peter and James and John. And he's about to leave them to go a little further. And he says, listen now, man, watch and pray. And he left them. And he came back to them. And when he came back to them, those three men, he found them sleeping. And you remember what the Savior said. He said, could you not watch with me one hour? The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Don't forget, beloved saints, in that closing parable that I've referred to, Christ is the man that's gone away. He has given to every servant his work. He has commanded the porter to watch. And he says to us, be vigilant. 
And as I'm speaking to you tonight, listen, beloved saints, we are expecting any moment the return of the Lord Jesus. And he expects that we should be vigilant. We're watching for Jesus. His promise is plain. His words true and steadfast. He's coming again. And the spirit of vigilance should be ours in these days. And the Lord Jesus says, watch therefore, for ye know not when the Son of Man comes. Noted for the work. The nature of the work. The last thing I'll speak about before I move on tonight, you will consider with me that these men were needed in the work. They were noted for the work. God took note. The nature of the work, they were expected to be vigilant, and God expects us to be vigilant. But they were noted, and they were needed in the work. How many of these men were there? There were actually 38,000 of them. Now, I won't take time to go through. I don't have time to do it tonight. But you'll find that in chapter 23. If you want the reference for that, chapter 23, and I think it's verse number three, will give you the record of these Levites, the porters. 38,000. Well, you say there weren't 38,000 doorkeepers. No, there weren't. But don't forget what the psalmist said. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. If you read in chapter 23, you'll actually find that 24,000 of these men had very prestigious work. They were involved in everyday work in the temple. They were involved with the vessels. They were involved with the sacrifice, 24,000 of them. And you and I would think that was quite a pre prestigious work. I wouldn't mind having part of that work, something that elevated service. I want part of that for the Lord's glory. And then 6,000 of them were magistrates and judges. They went through the land and the people would look at these Levites and the people would say, that's quite a work that they have got to do. Magistrates and judges. 4,000 of them were singers. So don't forget now, 24,000 had the prestigious task of work for God, moving the vessels and dealing with the vessels and working in the sanctuary. 6,000 of them, magistrates and judges. 4,000 of them were singers. There was always a song in the temple. You see, the Lord put a song in his people's mouths. Don't forget that now. He has put a new song in my mouth. If you had gone into that temple in the morning, there was the song of praise that was rising. If you had gone in the afternoon, the song was still rising, and it wasn't the same man. They actually took shifts. Pardon what, uh, I'm just using the colloquial expression, but they were in courses. The Bible calls it courses, and certain of them would be in the morning, and then they gave way to the afternoon, and the afternoon gave way to the evening, and 4,000 of them were singers, and there was a song in the house of God. Mind you, beloved saints, it's wonderful when there's a spirit of song in the house of God. Wonderful when there's a spirit of song in the assembly. Isn't it great when we gather together as God's people? And as we are there, there's a song rising and someone gives out a hymn. And just the very nature of that hymn, it adds to the worship. And sometimes, sometimes the tune. Sometimes I've listened to the tune of a particular hymn and I thought, oh. I prefer the other two, but I leave that one for 4,000 of them were singers. 4,000 of them were porters. I wonder what the porters thought. 24,000, I would like their work. Oh, that's a prestigious business. 6,000 of them, magistrates and judges, give me that work. 4,000 of them were singers and the voices rising in the sanctuary, rising to heaven. And 4,000 of them were simply standing at the door. And if you were going into God's house, if you were moving amongst the people of God, you would see a man standing at that door, vigilant. And you would say, what's your job? And he would say, it's a very menial task. The work that I have is just watching. But they were needed for the work. You know, beloved saints, no work is too menial when it comes to the assembly. I want to underline this tonight now. 
You see, there are gifts. And undoubtedly, there are men among us. And God has granted them gifts. I listen to them. I listen to them in gospel. And I think to myself, my, that man is gift. And I listen to the same man in ministry. And I say to myself, it's a very rare thing that a man that has such gift in ministry has the same gift in gospel. And then some of them, they can expound the scriptures like nobody's business. And I say, this is tremendous. And there are others. And they haven't been given the same work. You see, some of us, maybe myself included, some of us, God has said, your job is just to stand at the door. And you've just got a menial job. And your gift isn't the gift of someone else. It's not a public gift. But don't forget, beloved saints, in the chronicle here of 1 Chronicles chapter 9, these men were noted for their work. God took note. And the nature of their work, they were expected to be vigilant. And these men were needed for their work. Everyone that I'm speaking to tonight, you are needed for your work in the role that God has given you to do. And if I step out of the role that God has given me, I'm not doing what God has gifted me to do. And I'm also not doing what God is, I, I'm also trying to do what God has gifted someone else to do. The chronicle of the work. The second thing I'll speak about, and I won't take as long with this point, the centrality of the work. I thought this was very precious, actually. You see, if you go down to verse number 23, look at verse number 23. They and their children. That's, a, that's quite a thing. They and their sons. They weren't just involved in this work. But you see, their families, they made sure their families were involved in this work. And they and their, their children, their sons, had the oversight of the house of the Lord. And look at it, verse number 24, in the four quarters, towards the east, and towards the west, and towards the north, and towards the south, you would actually find some of these porters, these gatekeepers, and they were in the north. And you would find some of these gatekeepers, they were in the south. And you'd find some of these gatekeepers, and they were in the east. And you'll find some of these gatekeepers, they're in the West. And if you look down at verse number 27, it says, they lodged round about the house of the Lord. Now that tells me something, beloved saints. You know what it tells me? There was one thing that was central to their vision. One thing that occupied their vision. You see, I grew up in a family and I knew that with my father and mother, there was one thing that occupied their vision. You see what occupied the vision of these men? You can already tell. It was the house of the Lord. These men lived every waking moment for the house of the Lord. When these men woke, what they had in their vision, the house of the Lord. Whether they were in the north or the vantage point of the south or in the east or over in the west, every waking moment, these, these dear porters, what they were looking at and what they were interested in was the house of the Lord. So it has always been. If you go back to the tabernacle, I hardly have time to deal with this, but if you go back to the tabernacle, you will find that these men, the very central thing in their life was the tabernacle of the Lord. You'll remember Gershon on the west. You'll remember Kohath on the south. You will see that the Merarites, they were on the north and of course on the east at the very door of the tabernacle, there was Moses, and there was Aaron, and there was Aaron's sons. At the very focal point of their life was the Lord's house. Now, beloved saints, I want to challenge our hearts tonight. You see, a former generation. I've been speaking about a former generation. A former generation lived for the house of the Lord. You know them, and I know them. Dear older saints, and every waking moment, you know what they were interested in? God's house. Every waking moment, their focus was the assembly and the things of God. I just want to challenge our hearts tonight. Maybe there's a younger generation that's watching me via this Zoom call tonight. I want to challenge our hearts. I see folks on this call from Newfoundland. I see folks on this call from Nova Scotia. 
I'm aware of many on this Zoom call tonight, and you're in PEI, and I want to challenge my own heart as I'm challenging your heart. What's the focus of your life? Nothing wrong with education. I believe, I believe if, if it's what our children want to do, and if they have an aptitude for it, by all means, we should, if, if the Lord puts it within our, our, our own means, we should help them towards a good education, certainly. What about our own occupations, our jobs, and the things we're engaged in 24-7? Nothing wrong with that either. You remember the Lord Jesus, he dignified physical work. He was the one that was known as the carpenter from Nazareth. He dignified work, and he served as God menial tasks and pivotal tasks. Ah, but you know, beloved saints, our focus should always and ever be the Lord's house. Number one, our focus should be the Lord and the things of the Lord and the house of the Lord. And here were these men, and whether on the north or in the south or in the east or in the west, the vision of these men was the Lord's house. I challenge my own heart. What's my vision tonight? Is it still the assembly of God and the gathering of God's people? You will notice it was only for a night. Now, I've got to leave this. I, I don't have time to deal with this, but I, I, I'll throw this out to you, and I'll leave it, and I'll go on to my next point. Look at verse number 27. It says, and they lodged. You know what a lodging is? A lodging. It's just something for the night. These men were just lodging for the night. You know, I say, beloved saints, the night will soon be over. We're in a night scene. You remember in those two on the road to Emmaus in Luke's gospel, Luke's gospel, chapter 24. As they're traveling with Christ, they didn't know it was Christ. As they were on the Emmaus road, they, they said to that stranger that joined them, they said, listen, come in. Abide with us. The day is far spent and the night is at hand. Paul, I believe, actually takes up those words in Romans chapter 13. You remember what Paul says? Paul says, the night is far spent and the day is at hand. You see, these men, they had only a short window for service. They're lodging round about the house of the Lord and they only have a very limited exposure for service. And I say, beloved saints, tonight, our day of service or our night of service, it will soon be over. And we can serve God now. I would just encourage you tonight, you put your best foot forward tonight in the service of God. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. I'll speak a little bit on the last point, the chronicle of the work, the centrality of the work. One thing, one thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, the centrality of the work. The last thing I'll mention is the charge of the work. God gave them charge in this work. I've mentioned verse number 20, 27, the charge was upon them. I mentioned verse number 28, certain of them had the charge to do the work. Mind you, there was fidelity with this charge. They were faithful. You say, what were they faithful in? If you've got the copy of the scriptures open, look at verse number 26. Four chief gatekeepers. They were in their set office. They were over the chambers. Notice, they were over the treasuries of the house of God. That means that everything that came into the house of God, they had to be faithful. There was money coming into God's house. I would say about these men, they were faithful in everything they touched. I'm looking at men tonight. Let me just stop. I won't even handle the other things that I have before me, but I'm looking at men on the screen, and I'm looking at those, and there's been an offering every Lord's Day that has been given to the Lord in the assembly. And when that offering has been given, there have been men and they sat down and they counted that offering. And I would say there's men 
beloved porters tonight, and every cent, every cent was calculated, and they never took a cent for themselves. Here are these gatekeepers, and the Lord put into their hands the treasury of the Lord's house, and they're handling physical things, and they're handling spiritual things, and they're handling the work of God for his glory and for his honor. I like the Apostle Paul. I got to leave this. You remember what Paul says, Acts chapter 20. He says, I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. He says, I've been among you. He says, you know my life. He says, I was in Ephesus. He says, I moved among you, dear saints. And he says, you dear saints, you know, I didn't take a cent from you. Not one cent. And I've never been covetous of it either. And here we are, beloved saints, these gatekeepers, the fidelity of the charge. I would mention the function of the charge. If we got to that, we'd be here all night. I will mention one final thing, just to conclude the ministry tonight. The fidelity of this charge, the function of the charge to open the doors. The last thing I'll mention is the focus of the charge. These men didn't know it, but they were handling things that spoke of Christ. Look at verse number, verse number 29, vessels. All those vessels spoke of Christ. The instruments of the sanctuary spoke of Christ. The fine flour, it spoke of Christ. The wine, the oil, the frankincense, the spices, they all spoke of Christ. When you say the fine flower, what does that speak about? It speaks of the faultlessness of Christ. The wine, what does the wine speak about? The fruitfulness of Christ. You say the oil, what does the oil speak about? The fullness of the life of Christ. The frankincense, the fragrance of the life of Christ. The spices, all the facets of the life of Christ. And these men handle things, and they didn't even know it, that spoke of Christ. Just as I conclude tonight, how do I handle Christ? When it comes to the assembly now, I stand up before God's people and I handle Christ. How do I handle Christ? How do you handle Christ? Dear overseer, any of the deacons that do deacon work, men that are praying and worshiping, praising the Lord in the sanctuary, how do we handle Christ? I leave it for tonight. Gatekeepers, the work of God. Mind you, beloved saints, the work of God is still going on. And the psalmist says, I'd rather be a doorkeeper. You remember, that's a psalm of the Kohathites, by the way. I don't get into that for sake of time. Their forefather didn't value the house of the Lord. No, no. You remember Kohath was swallowed up in rebellion. God has no time for rebellion against his authority. No time at all. And here are these, these dear ones that were linked and look back to a forefather that didn't serve the Lord as they should have. And these dear ones say, I had rather be a doorkeeper. Just let me be a doorkeeper. I'd rather stand and watch the door in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wicked. May the Lord bless this meditation tonight and challenge our hearts about the work of God. Let's pray.